Hey, listen, let's get into God's Word. This is Revelation 21, uh, 9 through 27. And um, I want to ask a, ask a question. Do, do you think that we settle too easily? We resign ourselves to, to what we have right in front of us rather than living, often this is true, rather than living for uh, better things, rather than living for eternal things. We just settle for the thing that's in front of us. And C.S. Lewis, Christian philosopher and writer, pondered that very thing in a sermon that he once preached. And he said this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, reflecting on a very similar thing, the same theme, reflecting on life's difficulties, wrote to the believers in Corinth, and he said this, this light momentary affliction, all these trials and difficulties that all of us go through in life, these are preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And in fact, that phrase, eternal weight of glory, that's where Lewis, C.S. Lewis, got the theme and the title for the sermon that that verse, that uh, quote came from. And in Revelation 21, we see the weight of glory in the description of New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is, so to speak, Lewis's holiday at the sea. And it is, to use Paul's words, beyond all comparison. As we'll see in the passage, the presence of Christ in his glory, in that eternal city, chases away the night that we all endure. The question is this, will you and I move beyond the immediate circumstances of our life, whether those immediate circumstances are good ones that we've settled for, or bad ones that afflict us? Will we move beyond those immediate circumstances to see the eternal city that awaits us? Will, will we, will we rise out of making mud pies in the slum? Carry, be carried, allow the Spirit to carry us through our afflictions to live in that eternal city. So let me read these verses. This is Revelation 21.9 through to the end of the chapter. You follow along uh, in your Bible as I read. John writing, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the Son of Israel were inscribed. And on the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, and on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies foursquare, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its walls, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold 
a transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. For by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? Amen. What a passage. Well, look at this on the screen and in your notes. The glory of God chases away the night. And see this first, inviting me into eternal union with Christ. And notice it's an invitation. It's an invitation that you can accept or you can reject. By no means is God compelling us into his salvation. Nobody will be forced beyond their own will to choose Christ or to receive the benefits of his kingdom. He is inviting you, he is inviting me into an eternal union with Christ. And so the angel says in verse 9, he said to John, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And this is a reference, by the way, when we're talking about the wife of the lamb, the bride of Christ, what we're talking about here is all believers from all time all united together in Christ. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. United with the Lamb in marriage. And it's a picture that we have throughout the Scriptures. John saw verse 10, the holy city. This is a repeat of what we saw in verse 2 last week. The holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And so this is the bride. This is new Jerusalem both of which are essentially for the purpose of the prophecies here, New Jerusalem and the bride are synonymous. Or perhaps New Jerusalem is the dwelling place of the bride. And commentators disagree. Is New Jerusalem the bride herself? Is it the actual people of God or is it the place that the bride lives in? And commentators disagree and and we're not sure. And maybe it's both. The apocalyptic here is not as clear as we would maybe like it to be. But what is absolutely certain is this is the culmination of our hope, this marriage, that we would be one with Christ for eternity, no longer separated by sin and death, but enjoying instead the glory and blessedness of what was always the intended relationship between creator and creation, and that this will be enjoyed forever. I mean, all the way along, what we've been seeing as we, talk, as we think about this being an invitation, as we hear these descriptions, God's purpose in giving us the apocalyptic visions has been, first of all, to assure us, as Christians, to assure us that he has a plan. As we look at what happens in history, as we see what happens in our own lives, God said to us, you know what? I have a plan. I want you to be confident and to have hope in the midst of whatever you're going through that I have this all under control. The apocalyptic does that for us. But beyond that, it also assures us as Christians, it assures us that we can endure through it. And in fact, the apocalyptic is there to appeal to us, persevere, endure, no matter what you're facing, remain faithful to Christ. No matter what comes your way, no matter what happens in the world, continue to endure. And then thirdly, the apocalyptic is a, an appeal to those outside of the faith to be convinced of these truths and to turn to Jesus Christ in faith. And we've said that all the way through, 30 messages now, this is 31, all the way through, it's been an appeal to those who are right here or who are watching on the live stream, who have not yet committed their life to Christ, to do that, to become part of the bride of Christ. You could, there's an alternative for you. You could remain joined, you could remain joined, married, so to speak, to this world. In fact, chapter 21 of Revelation that we're looking at this morning and chapter 17 of Revelation that we looked at several weeks ago, listen, if you look at those two chapters, you lay them side by side and read them together, you're going to see all the parallels. Only in chapter 17, there are individuals who are choosing to be joined to the woman. 
to Babylon, to the mother of prostitutes, the great prostitute. That's a very different marriage. That's a bad marriage. And that's a marriage you should be wanting to get out of in favor of being joined to the Lamb for all eternity. One marriage ends in condemnation and death and is characterized by sin and every kind of horror you can imagine, everything that we've been reading in Revelation. The other marriage is filled with blessing and glory and is life itself for all eternity. But you get to choose. The invitation stands before you to enter into eternal union with Christ. And and if you do, then you will be made radiant. See this next. You'll be made radiant and precious before all. The description of New Jerusalem is, it's stunning. It's stunning. And I have to tell you, I have been overwhelmed in preparation for these messages in chapter 21. And it's been, there's been such a wait. How do you communicate the awesomeness of heaven in a sermon? How do you do that? Does anyone else know? Because I sure didn't know. In fact, as if to add to the pressure, this morning I, get, I come in here, it's nine o'clock, there's only a few people in the room just before nine o'clock, before the service, there's a dear saint sitting right down here in the second row, I know her well. She calls me over, Todd, I've been praying for you. She says, I read ahead. And I'm just praying that you can describe what's here in this passage, the beauty of it. And I go, I don't need the extra pressure. I appreciate the prayers. I appreciate the prayers. I don't want the extra. I know what I'm facing. Don't have to tell me. You can just pray for me without telling me. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Verse 11, it's stunning. It's stunning. Verse 11, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel like Jasper. This is a description of the city. Jasper is mentioned twice in this passage. It stands for that which is clear as crystal. Clear as crystal. That's what this gem points to. And that's an important characteristic of New Jerusalem because of what we're going to see in a bit when we start talking about light and the glory of God. We saw this word, in fact, back in chapter 4. I'll put it up on the screen here. Chapter 4, verse 3. And he who sat there, now talking about the throne, talking about Christ on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, two of the gems that are mentioned here. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So it's Christ himself on the throne also appearing. New Jerusalem is described this way. But Christ in chapter 4 is described as someone who is as clear as crystal. So pure. And we're going to circle back to what chapter 4 pointed to in terms of the rainbow. We'll come back to that in a few moments. But the words glory and radiance here are related in that they convey the brightness and the splendor of God. This is not reflected light. This is light itself. We have some examples of this in the Old Testament. It's so difficult even to describe or define the glory of God, but we have examples of what it is that help us to at least grasp somewhat of what we're talking about here. Moses, Moses actually said to the Lord, Exodus 33, he said, show me your glory. It's up on the mountain. Show me your glory. I want to see it. God says, yeah. No, it can't happen. You can't see my glory and live. But he says, tell you what, go tuck yourself in this rock, hide yourself here. I'm going to put my hand over you. I'm going to pass by. And after I've gone by, there's going to be like residual glory left. You're going to get to see a little bit of that. And that's what he got to see. And then he comes down. He doesn't think anything. He comes down, he's glowing, and people are terrified. They're terrified at seeing Moses with just the reflected glory of the passing remnant of the glory of God. Listen, if any of us look at the glory of God, we would be consumed in a second. That helps us to understand a little bit of the glory of God. Think about the tabernacle. So Moses establishes the tabernacle, um, Exodus chapter 40. And then later the temple would be built. Second Chronicles, I think it's Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, the temple is built. And in both cases, when they went to dedicate the tabernacle and the temple, what happened? The glory, of the glory of God came down into the tabernacle. Glory of God came down into the temple. And the priests who were actually supposed to go in the temple, this is the place where they're going to meet with God, couldn't go in for the glory of God. I'm not sure we can properly define it, but we could certainly see examples of it that help us to understand what exactly we're talking about here. And as overwhelming as it has been, 
when we are given our perfected bodies, when we start thinking about the glory of God and the impact on us, think about this. When we are given our perfected bodies in eternity, we will be glorified and we will be able to stand before the God who made us and saved us. We'll be able to look at God in his glory. In fact, in a verse that is similar to the one that we heard off the top, Paul says, Romans 8:18. 8, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, all the stuff we go through, whatever it happens to be, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing, notice, with the glory that is to be re- revealed to us. We're going to see the glory of God. God's glory to be manifested around us and in us. And in fact, here's the, here's the awesome thing about this. We don't see ourselves this way as having the glory of God inside of us. But God sees us this way. What, what, what a, just think about this. What a liberating thought it is to know that God sees you right now as radiant and precious. If you're in him, if you've confessed your sins, you've, you've, you've given your life to Jesus Christ, God sees you as radiant and precious. God sees you as having the glory of God in you. These visions of eternity are, as we've seen throughout Revelation, these are completed. I feel like I've said this so many times, but I I need to keep emphasizing the fact that John is not seeing storyboards of ideas about how God wants everything to play out. John is seeing visions of completed events. All of this has already happened. We're down here in the timeline, but we're looking at events that are outside of time and fully, fully, fully completed. So everything is done. All, all is done. Satan is defeated. Sin is erased. Death is no more. If you are in Christ, yes, in terms of the timeline, you are still being redeemed. You are still being sanctified. But from God's perspective, outside of time, he sees you as redeemed, as sanctified, as holy, as glorified. And so remind yourself, as you're working it out, working out your life here on the timeline, remind yourself that the glory of God is inside of you. Remind yourself, as I said, the glory of God is to be revealed in you, is being revealed, and is in you. And if we could understand that, that, I, that I'm glorified in Christ, that I have that glory inside me, if I could understand that, would that not radically change my life? Would it not radically change how I see the world around me? The concerns that we have, I mean, we are, we are, our whole value system, our mindset, everything about us is being shaped on a regular basis. Let's just talk about social media or the entertainment industry, and all of that is influencing us and changing us. We are being shaped, altered, our values changed. With every minute we spend on social media, we are being crushed. We are being crushed under a weight of self-evaluation and identity crisis because of what we see on social media. We can't possibly measure up, but I keep looking and I keep scrolling through trying to find some kind of personal validation. I'm never going to find it. But it's crushing my spirit as long as I do it. And here in the scriptures, what I'm hearing is that the glory of God is inside of me. Why, why then do I keep going to social media for validation? To try and figure something out. Why am I allowing the culture to assault my values and change the way I live my life? Man, if this is true for all of us as adults, I'm telling you it is a hundred times, a thousand times more true for our teenagers who are spending more time on social media and it is crushing them And they'll never tell you. It is shaping their mind. It is shaping their values. And it is crushing their spirits. And that concern could be alleviated if we could just tell them, if they would just listen and know that you have the glory of God in you. If you have Christ, you have the glory of God in you. And all that stuff on social media is so meaningless, empty, vain. It's crushing you.
We'll see next, beyond that, see next that the benefit of all of this is that I am bound with the one people of God. John describes in great detail the city here, verse 12. He says it had a great high wall, 12 gates, 12 angels. The word 12 is, number 12 is pointed to the perfection of all of this. 12 gates, 12 angels um, standing outside of them. On the, on the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. If you're taking notes, just write down that's very Old Testament. Okay? The, the, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are there on these gates, very Old Testament. Verse 13, on the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. Okay, for the directionally challenged, okay, among us who don't understand the compass, don't know what the cardinal points are, who are you? Raise your hands right now. You don't know? Just raise your hands north. Just raise your hands north. I'm making fun of you right now because you think north is up. But let me interpret this for those who are directionally challenged. This is the left gates, the other left gates, the right gates, and the other right gates. I know who you are. Verse 14, the wall. 12 foundations, on them the names of the 12 apostles of the land. Write down, very New Testament. So you have this, this picture of the Old Testament, this picture of the New Testament, 12 of each. And what we have in this description is another depiction of the one people of God. Sometimes we're so segmented in our thinking, so Old Testament, New Testament, we think the Jews were one thing and the Christians are another. We don't know what to do with the people before Israel. We're trying to sort the whole thing out. And let me just sort it out for you and tell you, there is only one people of God. One people of God. All believers from all epochs of history who believed the promise of a Savior. People have always only, at every moment of history, people have always only entered into a relationship with God through faith in believing the promise that he had given to them. That's the only way. Not making sacrifices, not doing pilgrimages, not praying certain prayers, not, not putting a certain religious label on yourself. None of that, none of that is effective for salvation. People have always only come to faith by faith in trusting in the promise. And all of this, of course, was subject to the amount of revelation they had received at that point. So if we can rewind all the way to the beginning, we go to Adam and Eve, the original sinners. Death enters into the world. The curse is pronounced. But also in Genesis 3.15, the very first mention of the gospel, not with the same level of revelation that we have about the gospel, but enough for them to believe and be saved. Namely, that through the seed of the woman, through the seed of the woman, the serpent's head would be crushed. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's Christ crushing the head of Satan. That's the gospel. And Adam and Eve, the only, the only thing they had to believe was this promise that someday Eve's line would produce a savior to crush Satan. Well, Abraham comes along and, and he would get a little bit more. The Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, God tells Abraham that he would make a great nation of him and that through that nation, in actual, in actual fact, Abraham was the father of many nations, but one of those nations, through that one nation, all other nations of the world would be blessed. And so now it's becoming in sharper focus. Now we know it's gonna come from Abraham's family. And we'll talk about all nations of the world being blessed in a few moments because it's here in the prophecy as well. Then Moses comes along. Another 600 years later, Moses comes along and he establishes the sacrificial system with the lambs and, and the rams and, and all of the other animal sacrifices. He constructed the tabernacle initially. Then there was the plans for the temple. He constructed the tabernacle and, and the sacrificial system and the tabernacle both pointed to the atonement for sin, the covering of sin that eventually, ultimately, will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, where Jesus would fulfill the Mosaic law. But at this point, the sacrifice of the animals was not actually causing the forgiveness of their sins and allowing them to be in relationship with God. It was faith in believing that God had given them a promise that eventually this would all be taken care of. David established the royal line from which Messiah would come. David prophesied of his future son in writing the Psalms speaking of the Messiah who'd come. Then the prophets would be given 
specific and very detailed information about the incarnation and the coming of Messiah. For example, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 9, Zechariah 11, just to name a few of the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Messiah. And then the Savior would come in the nativity. God made flesh to fulfill his earthly mission. In fact, Matthew 3.15 says to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus himself saying and quoting Isaiah, saying that he came, this is Luke 4.18, he came to proclaim good news, to tell us about this gospel. Then the apostle Paul, after all of the events of the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, Paul said that the coming of Christ brought Jew and Gentile together, merging, so to speak, the Old and New Testament believer. This is what he wrote to the Ephesians, but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you Gentiles who were outside of Israel, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, that dividing wall that existed, not only between Jew and Gentile, but the dividing wall of hostility that existed between us and God. That is what Christ died for. And in this, we see the merging of Israel and the church. And beyond that, those believers before Israel as the one people of God. Now listen, in a few short minutes, just in what I just said, in those few short minutes, I unloaded on you a ton of very deep theology. You could plumb the depths of that for days and weeks and months and years and not get to the end of it. But in the midst of all of that theology is this very simple application about reconciliation, about what God has done to bring us into relationship with himself. And from that then this, this, this ability to look at all of our relationships, all of our earthly relationships and relate the principle. So for anyone, as we, we look at a reconciling God who wants to make us part of the one people of God, for anyone dealing with issues of estrangement, Anyone dealing with issues of social anxiety, alienation from loved ones, anyone who's gone through breakups, anyone who's facing animosity from others, anyone who is disillusioned with a church or disillusioned with the church, this good news of Christ gives us the hope of belonging without any of the estrangement. It gives us the hope of being part of the one people of God in spite of what you may have experienced or in spite of what you may be experiencing right now. And I know it's tempting to stay isolated, but God wants us to be part of his family so that we can be working out all of this together. This right here, imperfect as it is, this right here is this picture this, this little bit of earnestness in advance of receiving the fulfillment in eternity. And Barnabas Piper, who's going to be here just a week and a half from now uh, to speak uh, on his book, he said this in, in his book, Belong. He said, moving from the darkness of withdrawal and withholding into the light of Christ moves us into true belonging. We encounter the healing of Jesus Christ as he cleanses us from the filth and infection of sin, and we encounter joyful unity with other Christians who have also entered the light. That's what it means to be the church. And since what we're seeing here describes our eternal home, our determination is to live that out as best we can right now, bound with the one people of God, because someday we will be dwelling, see this next, it's right here, we'll be dwelling together in the perfected creation. This same angel, verse 15, went about to measure the city. We've seen measuring going on earlier in Re Revelation. It's in Ezekiel as well. He went about to measure the city, which is described in verse 16. If you do the math there, it's described as a cube. Verse 17, he also measured its wall and it says this, by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement, which I thought was interesting that an angel would be using human measurement. I mean, I had lots of questions about that, and I wondered, with, are angels using tape measures from Home Depot? I mean, that's literally what came into my mind. But this is really just to say that the angel is using a measurement that we would understand so that we could, we could grasp 
a little bit of, of what's going on here, the scope of what this project is like. We're going to see that, in fact, the details don't matter so much as what we're going to see about the details. Then we get into the building materials. It's not studs and drywall. It's not steel and concrete. But again, verse 18, it's jasper. And it's gold like clear glass. So this is gold so pure that you can see through it. There are literally no impurities whatsoever. And this is something, again, God's trying to help us um, get to the place where we understand we couldn't make that. We can't make transparent gold. So this is far beyond our ability to fully understand and grasp. And it's all chosen. Why? Because it amplifies the glory of God. It amplifies the light. It reflects it. And not just light, but notice verse 19, the foundations were adorned with every kind of jewel. And then he lists them. I'm not going to read them all again. Verse 20, I, I, was, um, I, I think I mispronounced at least one of them. I don't want to take another shot at it. So I practiced and practiced and still blew it at 9 a.m. So I'm not going to read it again, but you can read the list there. But he lists all the different jewels. And the emphasis here is not so much on the jewels themselves, but listen, the colors. The colors that they project as the glory of God shines through them. These are beautiful colors. These are, these are colors like, these are unimaginable colors beyond anything we could possibly understand. They project the glory of God. Beautiful colors representing, listen, not beautiful colors not representing the perverse distortion of God's creation, but representing purity and perfection. Colors once given as a promise to humanity through Noah concerning our eternal salvation, which is now received and fulfilled. This is what we're seeing. This is the rainbow redeemed in eternity. And again, that refers us back to chapter 4, verse 3. Verse 21. And the 12 gates, 12 pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, Think about the size of the oyster. <laughs> like, I'm never going in the ocean again. <laughs> because we have this concept of the pearly gates. We hear about the pearly gates, and we think of all these little pearls, and it's all studded with pearls. No! The gate is massive, and it's one pearl, the Scriptures tell us. Again, it's awesome. It's beyond what we can understand. The street of the city, notice, was pure gold, like transparent glass, just like we saw. The description leads us to believe that the city is a perfect cube. If it is literal, commentators agree that the dimensions would be 2,500 cubic kilometers. Now, notice this. i got a map here. How many people like maps? You're my people. All right. How many people have no idea what you're looking at right now? It's North America. <laughs> How many people can find Barry on the map? I've helped you out here. Where is it? White dot, Barry, Ontario. All right, so you're getting a little bit of the scope of things here, but this is it. 2,500 kilometers per side. This is how big New Jerusalem is if, you, if you're following the math here and the measurements. Plus, it's 2,500 kilometer, kilometers high, so it's a cube, and it's sitting smack dab in the middle of North America. And so just to understand the scope of this, all right? If you've ever driven to Florida, this, this is going all the way from James Bay to Florida. How many people know where James Bay and Florida are on the map? Just raise your hand if you know. You're my people, right? <laughs> but that's how big it is. And then it goes all the way from pretty much the East Coast all the way over to, say, Colorado. I mean, this, this, is, this is the measurements that were given for New Jerusalem, consumes a huge portion of our continent. And yes, you can certainly take it literally, and many, many people see this as literal. It's a literal city that's coming down. I don't know for sure. It might be. It might not be. It might all be symbolic. But for sure, this is a very symbolic description. The thing that we're supposed to see in here is, is, is that it's massive. It's symmetrical, it's magnificent, it's perfect. We're supposed to see that it's complete. It's not lacking in any way whatsoever. That's what's important to take out of this. 
The description is meant to overwhelm our senses and stretch our ability to picture it in our mind's eye. If you're struggling right now to understand how this could be, perfect. That's exactly what God intends in this moment, that you would be overwhelmed with the description. It pushes beyond the limits of our grasp. Be okay with the mystery. Be okay with the awesomeness of the apocalyptic without having to always be so literal. Because in being literal, we often miss the very thing that God is seeking to say to us. In fact, I was reading this passage and the first thing I thought of was at the end of Ephesians chapter three, there's this wonderful benediction that Paul writes. And in there he says, he says that, that and, and really describes New Jerusalem here, that it goes far beyond what we could ever ask or imagine far beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. And in the end, this is what we want more than anything else. We want to be in the awesome presence of God. We want to be overwhelmed by him. And that's what we talked about in the first part of chapter 21, last week's message. That we're dwelling together in the perfected creation. But here's here's the impact of that on us now, because it matters now. I put a quote into the notes. I'm sorry that it's not on the screen. This comes from Fanning, one of the commentators I'm using through this series, and he says this. Our anticipated future has a strong influence on our present identity and conduct. And if we live in light of that future now, we will bear living witness to the world around us that human life can be different from what we have all come to accept as the status quo. That's exactly what Lewis was saying off the top. We've settled. There's so much more for us. So dwelling together in in the perfected creation, and then finally this, you got one more in you? Everybody good? You? One more in you, this side? All right. One more. Enjoying unhindered relationship with God forever. Verse 22, John saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. The earthly temple for Israel, of course, was a temporary dwelling place for the Shekinah glory of God. It was a place for God to meet with his people and for the Christian, both individual Christians and the church. We understand now the temple is gone. That part of Israel's worship is no more. But in terms of Christians, Paul said that as individual Christians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the church collectively, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, is also the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the temple, so the Holy Spirit lives in the temple. Me. He lives in me as a Christian. He lives in you as a Christian. And he lives in us as the church. That's the temple of the Holy Spirit. But even then we realize, okay, that's fine. We realize that this is only a partial reality for us. It's not perfect. Because though as a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells us, though as as a collection of believers in the church, the Holy Spirit indwells us, we still face temptation and we still sometimes choose to sin. I'm not wrong about that, am I? Even though the Holy Spirit is indwelled inside me, I still face temptation and sometimes I give in to that and I sin. Though we have the Holy Spirit and he's indwelling us, we're still subject to harm. We're still subject to disease. We're still subject to physical death. In in the the church is is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, but we can still, Christian on Christian, we can still be hard on each other sometimes. Not in this church, but in other churches I've heard of. (laughs) We struggle with this. The end goal for the Christian is to arrive in that city where no temple is needed. Just as it was in Eden. Verse 23, the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. Those are created bodies, celestial bodies. We don't need those anymore for the glory of God. Verse 23 continues, the glory of God gives it light and its lamp lamp is the lamb. That's the fulfillment of Isaiah 60, verse 19. Ladd said this, it's doubtful that John intended to give astronomical information about the new world. That wasn't his intent to comment on the sun and the moon not being there, but his purpose is to affirm the unsurpassed splendor which radiates from the presence of God and the lamb. 
Verse 24, by that light, by the, by the radiance and glory of God, by that light, the nations will walk. These are, these are chapter 7, verse 9. These are the every people, tribe, nation, language, all these people coming together. The physical distinctiveness that we had on earth seems to be maintained in eternity. God made you the way he wanted to make you. He created you the way you are, and it's beautiful, it's radiant, it's the glory of God. And those distinctiveness that we had, those are going to maintain into eternity. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. There used to be power, there was power here on earth, but now everything is centered on Christ, and its gates will never be shut by day. And look, there will be no night there. Gates in ancient cities, the walls were there for protection. The gates were closed at the end of the day to protect against invasions, against robbers, against the wrong people coming in. If you were inside the city, you belonged there and you were protected behind the walls and behind the gates. These gates will never close because listen, and just imagine the impact in your own life now when I say this, all threats have been forever neutralized. Think about that in terms of your own life. All threats forever neutralized. No dangers, no illness, no attackers, no discord, no stress. Imagine it. No darkness to envelop us. Only light, only day, even now in eager anticipation of that eternal and final day. The Christian can chase the night away with with mustard seed sized faith with simple trust in the plan and purposes of God. And listen, all hell may break loose around you and you may still be at peace as a Christian. And that's because what happens outside of this body, what happens outside of me, the circumstances around me have no bearing on what's inside the body. The mortal around me does not inform the immortal. The temporal but does not impact the eternal. The body does not influence the spirit. We're one with Christ. We need to lean into that. These kings, whoever they may be, verse 26, will bring into New Jerusalem the glory and the honor of the nations. It's all glory to God from everyone, from all of creation. And notice again this assurance for us to hear it now more in the negative, verse 27, nothing unclean will ever enter it nor will anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name there? You've been invited. You've been invited. So my hope is through this very frail message, two messages in Revelation 21, my hope is that God would help us all grasp the awesomeness of what He is doing and has done for us in chasing away the night and giving us eternal day by his own radiant glory. I pray that we'd be able to grasp that and that we would stop settling for making mud pies in the slum and we would each look to have that holiday at the sea. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, again, these are lofty themes, difficult to fully grasp, beyond our finite brain's ability to understand. And yet, Father, you've given us great assurance in this chapter. And I pray, God, that we would lean in to embrace it as difficult as that might be, and that the glory of Christ would shine through us in a way that we would be able to navigate this life in a way that honors you, but then is so compelling to people outside of the faith. That they would demand an answer for how we're living. Father, I pray that you would bless this time of communion as we've talked about being the one people of God. You've given us this table, not only to be one with you and to remember your death for us, but Father, to be one with each other, the body of Christ, together receiving the bread and the cup. And so bless and sanctify this time. 
pray in Christ's name.